Okay, in this video we're going to discuss and demonstrate um, cranial strain patterns and uh, what we would feel as the sphenoid and the occiput um, go through their normal uh, or abnormal motions during each strain pattern. So um, when we are evaluating cranial strain patterns, uh, we define our strains based on motions of the sphenoid and the occiput. In terms of where we're palpating, we end up palpating greater wings of the sphenoid and the squam of the occiput when we're palpating in vault hold. So in that position, uh, this would be kind of our main position of uh, palpation. And if we were to then illustrate or represent those motions uh, that we're gonna go over uh, with just our hands, we would use um, the greater wings of the sphenoid and the occiput as reference points, and we would create uh, little hands like this that would become um, our representations of cranial motion. And uh, you'll see a number of those different uh, shadow hands, as they're called, uh, throughout the discussion. So uh, first, in uh, discussing and recognizing what's happening normally during flexion and extension, during normal flexion, uh, the sphenoid rotates anteriorly around a transverse axis that moves through the base of the sphenoid, and uh, the occiput uh, rotates posteriorly around a transverse axis um, above the frame magnum. So in flexion, um, the sphenoid and occiput move like this, and then during extension, um, that uh, opened motion uh, closes up and might even exaggerate in, um, in the opposite direction slightly. Uh, so how that manifests then in our hands is uh, during flexion, our fingers would move farther apart and inferiorly, and during extension, they would come together and move super superiorly. Uh, and that would be normal motion. Now, if we had a strain pattern where we had restricted range of motion in one direction or the other, uh, we could have uh, exaggerated flexion or exaggerated extension. So uh, for exaggerated flexion, what we would feel is uh, normal or exaggerated flexion, as is described, um, where the sphenoid and occiput move in kind of exaggerated motion, but then during extension, they never really fully close up or move into extension. So as a result, what we would feel is our fingers opening up during flexion and then during extension, they never really come uh, superiorly and feel like they kind of close up and then we enter the flexion phase again and then back and then enter the flexion phase again. Um, during exaggerated extension, what we would instead feel is a restriction during flexion phase. So during flexion, we would feel that the cranium doesn't quite open up. We don't feel as, as much of a, an open filling in our hands. And then uh, during extension phase, we feel that accentuated with maybe a little bit of extra um, extension. But uh, the main feature is that uh, the bones never really expand and move inferiorly during flexion. So exaggerated flexion and extension are the first of our set of physiologic strain patterns where the um, SBS and its normal motions are generally intact. Um, our next physiologic strain pattern would be um, a side bending rotation. So now for uh, a side bending rotation, what we essentially have is a restriction in motion where we have a kind of mismatched flexion and extension on either side. So we would end up having, let's say, flexion on one side, this right side, where the sphenoid and occiput move apart and inferiorly, but on the other side, we have an, a restrictive range of motion where it feels almost like that side is extending. Um, how that uh, comes about is we have a restriction that's causing uh, rotation of the sphenoid in one direction, and then we have rotation in the occiput in the opposite direction, and uh, both of those are around vertical axes, one through um, body of the sphenoid, then the other one through the forema magnum. So as a result, we end up with a rotation in opposite directions. We also end up with a little bit of uh, kind of side bending where we end up with the sphenoid and occiput also rotating around anterior posterior axes. But because we also have that rotation, it ends up being two anterior posterior axes one through frame and magnum kind of anteriorly, 
and then the other one through uh, the body of the sphenoid as well, kind of in the opposite direction. So how we would name that is um, by which uh, side becomes uh, convex, okay? So in this instance where we have kind of opening and inferior motion on the right side, we would call that a right side bending rotation. And on the, uh, the opposite would be a left side bending rotation where we would feel that opening on the left side, okay? Our next physiologic strain pattern uh, would be called a torsion. So if you think about um, the torsion terminology uh, when you are describing sacrum dysfunction, uh, the way we describe torsion is essentially a twisting motion where you have the sacrum rotating uh, in one direction and then L5 rotating in the opposite direction. In this instance, it's going to be very similar where the occiput rotates in one direction and then the sphenoid rotates in the opposite direction. So both of the, um, both, both of the bones are going to be rotating in opposite directions around, in this instance, a single anterior-posterior axis that goes through the frame of magnum and then through the body of the sphenoid. And now, uh, how we're going to name um, those dysfunctions will be defined um, by which greater wing of the sphenoid we feel moves more superiorly. So if the bones move in this direction, we would feel uh, kind of a twisting in our hands and we would call that a right torsion. In the opposite direction, we would feel uh, the left greater wing of the sphenoid move superiorly, and we would call that a left torsion. Um, and the uh, reason this is kind of a, still a physiologic pattern is uh, the SBS motion is still intact, where it hasn't really sheared apart, and we kind of have a twisting motion around that, um, around that SBS. Now, moving on to the non-physiologic or pathologic uh, strain patterns, essentially for each of these, we have uh, abnormal motions at the sphenobasilar symphysis. So for each of these uh, pathologic dysfunctions, we essentially have an abnormal motion at the sphenobasilar symphysis, and, which are usually uh, shearing patterns or compressive uh, kinds of patterns. So uh, the question we can ask of ourselves, of course, is which directions can um, the sphenobasilar symphysis shear in. Um, so certainly they can shear laterally, and then they can shear uh, uh, vertically, this way and this way. So first, discussing a lateral strain pattern or a lateral shearing force at the SBS, um, essentially what's happening is the sphenoid and the occiput are going to rotate in the same direction around vertical axes. And again, our vertical axes are through the uh, frame of magnum and through the body of the sphenoid. So they're rotating in the same direction around that vertical axis, um, and as a result are causing uh, shearing force at the SBS. Um, now there's a few different ways that it's described as, um, it's described in terms of how you're going to palpate it in your hands. Um, one description um, focuses on more of the shearing force, where if we're defining and kind of uh, illustrating by our shearing force, we could illustrate that by showing our hands uh, kind of shearing uh, laterally this way, and this would create a parallelogram in uh, that direction where we would see a right lateral strain where the sphenobasilar symphysis has shifted to the right, um, and we end up with a parallelogram towards the right side. Another description focuses more on the rotatory force of the strain pattern, where um, if we're thinking of our two vertical axes, and then we're considering uh, the rotation around those axes, the sphenoid would rotate to the left, which would bring the greater wing of the sphenoid anterior and medial, and then the occiput would rotate also to the left, where um, the squama of the occiput swings laterally and anteriorly. Um, as a result, that would feel more like a parallelogram that is shifting to the left. As a unifying uh, descriptor of what, uh, of how we're going to define our lateral strains, we're going to be focusing on what the base of the sphenoid is doing in each pattern. So as we're focusing on rotatory force, um, 
or the rotatory uh, vectors of abnormal uh, motion, um, we're going to consider this motion with a parallelogram forming this way as a right lateral strain as the uh, base of the sphenoid shifts to the right during that phase of motion. Um, in an opposite direction, we would find a left lateral strain where they're rotating in opposite directions um, and our parallelogram we would feel move to the right as our occiput swings laterally. Okay. Um, our next uh, pathologic uh, strain pattern uh, that we're going to talk about is a vertical strain. So in this instance, uh, similar to our lateral strains, the sphenoid and occiput are going to rotate uh, in the same direction, but this time around transverse axes. So um, first, we can have a superior vertical strain where um, both the sphenoid and occiput rotate anteriorly around transverse axes, and that transverse axis is um, through the base of the sphenoid and then above the um, uh, foramen magnum. And uh, we're naming this a, a superior vertical strain uh, because of the direction that the base of the sphenoid moves. It moves superiorly relative to the occiput. And in the opposite direction, it would be an uh, inferior vertical strain. Now, what would that feel like? Uh, what it would feel like due to um, kind of the motions of the greater wings of the sphenoid and the occiput is during a superior vertical strain, we would feel as if our hands are going to kind of fall forward, um, which we would represent by uh, kind of a shifting of our fingers forward and our wrists kind of uh, coming up. So we can kind of think of our wrists moving superiorly as a superior vertical strain. In the opposite direction for an inferior vertical strain where um, the base of the sphenoid is moving inferiorly because of that direction of um, the sphenoid and occiput, we could think of our hands uh, coming this way. So this would be representative of an inferior vertical strain uh, with our wrists kind of representing the SBS as it moves inferiorly. The last pathologic um, motion pattern um, is a compression, which is essentially defined as um, restricted motion at the sphenobasal symphysis in all directions of motion. So during both phases of flexion and extension, we essentially have very limited or no motion. So um, in flexion, there's not much motion. Extension, there's not much motion. Very, very small motions are palpated. Um, and what ends up happening is we end up feeling that as kind of a stagnant cranium that feels very heavy, um, often described as a bowling ball feeling, um, which is kind of a very typical way of describing uh, that feeling. But essentially, we have no motion in any of the directions. Um, and that will conclude our discussion and illustration of uh, cranial strain patterns.